Well, if you have a copy of God's Word this morning, open it to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Apostle Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, one command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Let's pray. Lord, your word is rich. It is perfect for training us in righteousness. It reveals you, your character. It reveals the Savior and salvation and justification and sanctification and glorification. It reveals our purpose, the design that you've designed us for. And Lord, we thank you for revealing these things to us. And we pray that you would grant understanding this morning as we seek to understand your word here and how it would impact us as individual Christians, as Christian families, and as a church. Help us, Lord, to to put you first in our life. May Christ have preeminence. As we sang, may Christ be magnified in our life. And your faithfulness is perfect. And we find joy and satisfaction in the faithfulness of our King. And we pray that you would bless us now through the preaching of your word. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. So I want to do a little recap as just from the last two weeks so that we remember this. The doctrine of justification frees a person from the exactment of the law. The doctrine of justification frees a person from the exactment of the law because justification removes the penalty of lawbreaking. Removes the penalty of lawbreaking, and it does this by faith in Christ, his perfect righteousness, the atoning work of Christ on the cross, both of those are imputed to our account. We do not, we do not pursue obedience for the purpose of earning. Right? We do not pursue obedience for the purpose of earning. Grace is in opposition to earning. Remember I said that six times last week. Grace is in opposition to earning, but grace is not in opposition to obedience out of love. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit affecting in us the promises of the new covenant, we have freedom. That's what we talked about the last two weeks. We define Christian freedom. Christian freedom is not freedom from caring about sin. Christian freedom is the freedom to pursue being like Christ in imitation. And human beings are truly free when they are no longer under the dominion of natural desires. Now, last week we talked a little bit also about the goodness of God's commands. By the work of the Holy Spirit, we've been given new eyes, we've been given a new heart, and we now see and experience the goodness and the joy in obeying God. Right, We've, We now see and experience, because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, regenerating us, taking that heart of stone out, giving us a heart of flesh as the new covenant promises, and we now experience the goodness and the joy in obeying God. We understand that the greatest joy and happiness that can be experienced in life is, when the, is within the parameters of pursuing obedience to God. And now, with that, I want, us to, I want us to look at the command that we have in verse 
13. I spoke about it just for a second last week because I just pointed out that there's a command. There's an imperative here, right? New Testament epistle. Paul's been talking about justification and bam, imperative. Okay? Imperatives are not a bad thing. It's your motivation for pursuing them that can be a bad thing or a good thing. Okay? And so I want us to look at this command here that we see in verse 13. He says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And here's the command. But through love, what? Serve one another. That's what my translation says. Through love, serve. Serve one another. That, that verb there, serve, that's the command. Through love, serve one another. Our Christian freedom is not to fulfill the desires of the flesh. Life is not meant for the enjoyment of sinful desires. That is not what life was designed for. That is not what God created us for. That is not what salvation is for. Life is not live it up, drink, eat, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? That's not what life is meant for. And somehow, our, our fallen state is hindering, or, or, or this is what is said, you know, somehow it's just our fallen state is hindering us from the enjoyment of it. And that's the curse. I mean, the, the, this, is, this is somewhat what the Corinthians were going through. This thought process, and Paul was correcting them in the, in the epistles to the Corinthians. You know, life is, enjoy, is for the enjoyment of sinful desires, and the curse just keeps us from enjoying it, and it heaps guilt on us, right? And so salvation frees us from the guilt so that we can pursue and enjoy Sinful desires, but that's, that's false. That's not biblical. Salvation is for the correction of the mind, the correction of the emotions, and the correction of the desires. To allow us to pursue and understand what God intended for us to pursue. which is, at the same time, the best thing for us. It's the beauty of God's commands. We're saved. God gives us new desires, new understanding, right? Because the natural man cannot understand the things of God. But we have the mind of Christ. The spiritual man can. We've been given a new heart we're being renewed to understand the things of God, to desire them, and to pursue them with the understanding that as we pursue what God commands, God has placed us in that for the greatest joy and the greatest pleasure that this life can offer. And by the way, sin, we, we see the command here, through love, serve one another. Let, let me tell you this. Sin never serves anyone. Sin never serves anyone. It uses others negatively for the sinful gain of the person pursuing the sin. Sinful behavior is the opposite of serving others. We're, we're actually, when we're, when we're living a, a sinful life and, and we're, we're pursuing that sinful life with others, what we're actually doing is we're leading ourselves and influencing them to the detriment of both. And so you're not serving others or yourself when we're sinning. And Paul says here that our freedom in Christ is for ser the serving of one another. Brothers, Christ has set you free for freedom. Christ has set you free. Now use that freedom not to fulfill the fleshly desires, but to serve one another. 
Paul says our freedom in Christ is for the serving of others. And when we do, we do with the benefit of others in mind. In other words, when we're serving others, we're, we should be thinking, is, is this going to be beneficial for them, biblically? Not worldly beneficial, because that's not really beneficial, but biblically beneficial. How will this impact their walk with the Lord? How can I help them in my serving them for the glory of God? Will my actions serve others in a good way, or will my actions harm others, biblically speaking? And this is a crucial thought. This is a very crucial thought that I don't know we, if we think about enough. Because Paul says that our calling as Christians is to serve one another, to serve others. And it's easy to say, but it's very hard to do. It's very hard to follow through on. Because here, here's the reality. Our, our sinful fallen nature screams everything in creation should serve me. And I will use everything in creation to serve me. That's what our sinful nature screams. One of the most challenging verses, I believe, in the Gospels is found in Luke 14, verse 12 and through 14. And Jesus said this. He said also to the man who had invited him, because this, this person invited Jesus in, hey, come, come to my house, let's hang out, right? And Jesus is saying things to him, and he also said to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, before we get nervous and think, man, I've had lots of friends over, it's not what Jesus is saying. It's, he's, not, he's not outlawing having your family over and friends over. What he's getting at is the motive because what feasts and banquets were back then and still today are invite the people that can give back in some way, right? Invite people over to your house that can in the end turn that favor back to favor for you. Kind of like political parties where you're shaking hands and trading business cards in the hopes that you can get some big clients or going to a big church that, ha that you're doing the same thing or a big club, clubhouses, organizations, all these things that people join in the hopes for business contacts, right? And their motive in doing this was to be repaid with favor. That's what Jesus is getting at here. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. How will you be blessed? Because they can't repay you. So how are you going to be blessed? You're going to be blessed in Christ. You're going to be blessed by the rewards that God gives you. What Jesus is calling us to here, and what Paul is calling us to here in Galatians, is when we're serving others, we serve others with no desire for receiving blessings back from the ones we serve. And as I said, easier said than done. In other words, you, you are just serving people because that is the, the, the expression of biblical love. You're only serving people because they are image bearers and you want what is best for them and that is all. Let me, let me, just, let me just invoke a thought maybe here. How, how many times 
when we are treated poorly, do we break out the list of good things we have done for that person? Right? I don't know why you treat me like this. I've done this and this and this and this and this. You know what's implicit in that? Because I've done this, you shouldn't treat me like that. I've done enough to earn you treating me the way that I want you to treat me. And as soon as that treatment of me ends that I think I should get, then I'm not treating you the way I should treat you anymore. Do you see how, how ingrained that is in us? How hard it is for us to serve those who cannot repay. And what we really need to do when we think about think, saying things like that and breaking out the list is why am I bringing this up like this? Why have I done these things for this person? Have I done those things so I will receive back? Or have I done those things because that's what God has designed me to do? Have I done those things because I love the Lord and it's a way of me expressing my love for God? We like to say things are gifts to others but in actuality, many times those gifts are actually to gain power over people. So that we can say, when we need to pull that trump card, you owe me. We even flatter others and do good to others for the purpose of being served in the end. And that's what Jesus is really getting at in that passage. Is think about your motivation in serving others. Is it for the glory of God is it, or is it for the glory of me? We, we, we often serve people so that they'll say good things about us or so they'll do much for us or so that they'll heap gifts upon us or so that they'll treat us the way we feel we should be treated. And here's the thing. In our fallen condition, this is the only way we think. It's the only way we think. In our saved condition, this is the mindset that we are being tempted to fall back into all the time. All the time. In every relationship. Every relationship. I mean, if you're honest with yourself, you've thought, well, do, do I want to be around that person? How do they make me feel? How does that person make me feel when I'm around them? Not good? Eh. I'm, right? About four of us are honest. Living out this truth... I mean, seeing this temptation in us, seeing us fall prey to such thinking shows the evidence of the power of sin in our life. The corruption of sin in every heart. But, but listen to what Paul says in a, in a similar way. And he, and he quotes the Lord here. In Acts 20, 35, he says this, In all things I have shown you, that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to re receive. Now, I, I mean, how many times have we quoted that verse? It's more blessed to give than to receive. But here's the thing. Well, if we hear that, if we hear that, it's more blessed, you're more blessed when you're giving than you are when you're receiving. There are more blessings in giving than receiving. 
So giving is a context for greater joy than receiving. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. There is a greater context for joy when we are serving and we, when we are giving than when we are receiving those things. That's what it means when it says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that is in, that's such a strange saying to our ears and our hearts. It's in such opposition to the way that we naturally think. Because the world teaches gimme, gimme, gimme. And our flesh cries gimme, gimme, gimme. Or give me, right? And the world says, and the flesh says, build more and more and more storehouses. Never give until it hurts. That's what the world says. And our flesh is pulled to it. The worldly mind says never give until it hurts. Only give up until the reciprocating benefit ends. Only give until the reciprocating uh, giving or benefit ends. So in the world, just a couple of examples, and this is more corporate, but I've been there, done that in the corporate world. This would equal give until the tax break ends. Right? This is how much we can give, and we will receive a tax break on that, and we're not going to give any more. Or give until marketing impact ends. Because it's all marketing. Right? And Paul says here that Christ has set us free in order to serve one another. In order to give. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And, and we've been, and here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. Here's the reality. Christ has set us free in order to serve one another without worrying about the compensation of giving. We don't have to worry about getting paid back. We've been set free from that. Because here's the reality. Everything that we need, dear Christian, we have in Jesus. Everything that we need, we have in Jesus. So we can give and give and give and not worry about getting back because we already have everything we need in Christ. Do we believe that? Do we believe that we've been made joint heirs with Christ and everything that's his will be ours with him? That one day the whole universe will be ours because we're in Jesus. And one day that inheritance will be fully realized. But now we live in the light of our inheritance in Jesus. And we confess. It's a confession. It may be a silent confession. But it's a confession that we make through our our serving, we confess through our selfless giving that we, we have all we need in Christ. And Paul tells us something very important about this kind of giving and serving one another through love. You notice there in verse 14 that he says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word or one command. He says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul here is speaking of the second greatest command, which sums up the second tablet of the moral law. Living this way, serving one another through love, is indeed how the second table of the moral law was meant to be fulfilled. 
Now, Christ fulfilled it for us. But, but this is what Paul's saying. When we serve one another, this is a fleshing out of God's original design in creation. When we serve one another without concern for being paid back, when we serve those who can't repay or we serve those who can, but we have no thought of that in our minds, we are actually fleshing out God's original design for us in creation. We were originally designed to serve one another. To serve one another. Or to say it differently, this is the kind of living and loving others that is exactly what God has designed you for. And there's nothing better than doing what you're designed for. Now, our problem is, is that we struggle believing it. We struggle believing this. We struggle daily believing that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And if obedience to God is the greatest context for joy and happiness, and we have been designed by God for serving others, we should be looking for ways to serve one another biblically. Amen? I mean, how, how, how gracious and merciful and wonderful is it that, that what God wants us to do and how we can pursue and express our love for him, he's designed us for. And he's renewing us day by day so that we can pursue those things in greater ways. And, and really, I, we should be evaluating our motives in serving and giving constantly. And, and, and let me say this because this is important. We don't evaluate for the purpose of whether or not to obey. What do I mean by that? I mean, I've heard this. I've, I've had people ask me this question. I, I've felt it myself before. And, and here's, here's the way it goes. Well, if, if I can't obey perfectly, then why do it? I mean, if my heart's not in it, then why do it? And that's not the kind of evaluation I'm talking about. Because this is what that is. That is going back to the exactment of the law. When you're saying, if I can't do it the right way or the perfect way or with the right motive, then why do it? You're looking, you're going back to a mindset of earning rather than resting. You're going back to a mindset of earning with God rather than resting in God. And so I don't mean an evaluation like that. Because when we evaluate... We evaluate for two things, at least two things. We're evaluating to send us back so that we can abide in Jesus. Because when we abide in Jesus, we have the strength to do and we have the joy to do. And so we're evaluating, Lord, am I doing this? Why am I about to pull this list out on my brother or sister in Christ? Or why am I about to pull this list to show someone that they shouldn't treat me like this? Was, were, my, were my motives so that one day I could pull the card and say, you owe me? If that's the truth, Lord, then help me abide in you. I, I don't need anything other than what you've already given me and what I will inherit fully one day in Jesus Christ. Help me to abide in you. Help me to remember in this moment the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I have everything I need in Jesus. And that will fuel my strength to do, and it will undergird my joy to do. Because we've been freed from the exactment of the law. We're not serving and giving out of a motive to earn, 
We're serving and giving out of a love for what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ. Another important truth here, and I'll try to speed it up. You guys listen faster. Galatians 5.15, he's, he's moving along here. God's designed us. He's set us free so that we can serve one another. We can love one another. We can bear one another's burdens. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And here's what we see in this as we, as we look at the, the whole of the epistle. Legalism and antinomianism both feed the devouring of one another. Both were probably going on in the church. There's usually both in every church to some degree or another. One was saying, we don't need the law at all. And the other saying, we need to obey in order to be in covenant with God. Right? Both are the, both have a view where the pendulum has swung in an unbiblical manner. Both end with one another devouring each other. So how? How, how does that happen? And here, here's the thing. Legalism really stands on me being better than you. Because here, here's what it feeds on. It feeds on the feeling of self-righteousness. It, it feeds on the feeling of me being righteous in myself. And for me to feel righteous in and of myself, there has to be other people that I'm more righteous than, right? Because we can't look at God to be the standard. So we have to, as Paul says in, in, in Corinthians, that we, we should not judge ourselves according to those around ourselves because that's foolishness. And the thing about it is, that's, what, that's the exact thing that legalism feeds off of. And that's why if you've ever been legalistic or you've run into legalistic people, they have this huge list of things you do and don't do in order to have God blessing your life. It's, it's a whole world of good day, bad day Christi Christianity. And they're feeding that template on everyone else in the hopes that everyone else sees them having it together. And so peer value and peer thought are incredibly important in a system of legalism so that it comes to be a system in which we pretend like we don't sin. Right? And so the church becomes a museum of saints rather than a hospital for sinners. And when you read through the Gospels, you see Jesus confronting this all the time with the religious leaders. You tie, yeah, you tie down to the mint leaf, but you forget the weightier things like justice, mercy. Now, in stark contrast with that, antinomianism is somewhat, like I said earlier, it, it's living in such a way that sin is to be enjoyed. Christ has freed us to enjoy life. Let's have fun, right? Let's, let's sin it up. And sin... And they say, Paul dealt with this in Romans, sin, doesn't sin cause God's grace to look greater? Paul says, certainly not. Because we're no longer under the dominion of sin. We've been freed from that. We've been freed from seeing sin as good. And now we see sin as what nailed Christ to the cross. And Paul states here in this passage, sinful living is never serving others for their good. Sinful living is feeding off of others at the detriment of others and self. So both are self-centered. And if you're in a, a worldview or in a state of mind of self-centeredness, you can't serve others with the proper motive. So Paul gives this biblical gospel-centered command, and he says, you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom 
as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This, Paul says, is what you were designed for. This, this, is, this is us showing that the inner man is being renewed day by day when we serve one another selflessly. And it's not easy. Amen? It's not easy. It, it takes prayer. It takes getting before the throne of God in prayer and asking God to help us abide in him so that we can do it with the understanding that we have all that we need in Jesus Christ. Everything that we need, we have in Jesus Christ. And so it frees us to say, I don't, I don't need anything outside of that. And so I can serve you without ever having to write it down and making a list, right? And I'm serving you not so that you'll treat me the way I feel you should treat me. I'm serving you because I love God. And there is no greater picture than God serving mankind than the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this word. We thank you, Lord, for the commands you give us. We love you, and we love you because you first loved us. And because we love you, we want to, to please you. We want to imitate you. We want to pursue um, joy. And you have shown us in your word that the greatest context for Christian joy is pursuing obedience to you. And we have everything we, we need in Jesus. And one day, everything will be ours because everything is Christ's. And we long for that day. And so help us, I pray, as a church and as people who have neighbors and people who have co-workers and people who have family, help us through love serve one another. Not through flattery, not through hoping it's reciprocated, but through love for God, help us to serve our fellow man, knowing that we have everything we need in Jesus Christ, and it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we pray all this in Christ, who served us in the greatest way. Help us to imitate him, we pray in his name. Amen.